Uh, my name is Louisa Pantiero, as it says there. I'm a mediation officer with the Residential Tenancies Branch. I've been with the branch for nine years in a couple of different roles. For the first few years, I was a client services officer, so I dealt with uh, inquiries over the phone and in person. Uh, and a rent regulation officer for a couple of years, and now uh, for the last two years, I've been a mediation officer, actually the last year, sorry. And to me, that's uh, a job that uh, I find quite fulfilling because it allows uh, the prevention of ev eviction, which is basically the goal or of my presentation today. So uh, I've started the presentation just by starting out some of the basics, which is what tenants should know or what they should make sure uh, before they start looking for a rental unit. Uh, obviously, primarily one of the main, re main things is to ensure that they have the ability to pay the rent that for the unit that they're uh, that they've chosen to move into. Uh, the second thing would be to understand and follow the house rules or the terms on the tenancy agreement, for example, no pets and no smoking. Um, the no pets thing I, I can delve into quite deeply, but just briefly, if it says no pets on the tenancy agreement and someone tries to tell you to go ahead and have pets, you know, encourage your clients uh, to ensure that someone from uh, the landlord gives them something in writing that confirms it, despite the fact that the tenancy agreement says no pets, that they're allowed to have them. Um, to request that a condition report's done when they move into the rental unit, and oftentimes uh, that's not done, and so we encourage the tenants to do their own. Uh, and now to, with today's technology, to take photos or videos of the rental unit and the condition, just so that they have evidence uh, when they move out or if someone tries to accuse them of causing damage, that they have evidence of what the condition of the unit was when they move in. Um, to understand that they're responsible for the behavior of their guests or family members while visiting. Sometimes tenants don't realize that if they've had company over and when the company leaves, they cause damage to the property or cause a disturbance, that they are responsible for the behaviors of their company. Um, and that no amount of noise is acceptable if it disturbs others. I'll often hear, well, I mean, it was between 10 and 7 p.m., so, I mean, it shouldn't matter how loud I had my music. And if it is disturbing somebody else, then it does matter because it'll create complaints, which will then result in, you know, warning letters or uh, perhaps termination. And also to report a repair as soon as they become aware of one, because sometimes uh, if they don't let the landlord know of a specific repair that may cause damage to the property, then that may also again result in possible termination. I didn't miss anything. So another thing that I thought I'd uh, put up there would be what tenants shouldn't do. So they shouldn't allow other people to stay in their unit without written permission from the landlord. And by that I mean not just an overnight stay, but if you have somebody staying for a couple of weeks, it's best to get something in writing from the landlord that shows that that person's approved to stay there for a couple of weeks or if you have a relative coming in from overseas, whatever the case may be. Um, another thing that tenants should never do is remove the smoke alarm. If you have a smoke alarm or if the tenant has a smoke alarm that uh, goes off and you're cooking or showering, which sometimes happens, don't remove it because that could be a reason for a five-day termination. It's best to immediately contact the landlord, and if the landlord's not doing something about it, call the branch, and we'll make an attempt to contact the landlord. Just do not remove it. Uh, we, in our breakout session, we had a little conversation with respect to paying rent in cash. Um, I tell the tenants, you know, I don't care what you put it on, uh, whether it's a cigarette package or a, a napkin, never ever hand over cash without getting acknowledgement that you've paid it. We'll often find out that a tenant says that they put rent in a drop box and we'll tell them never to do that again because obviously there's nobody to confirm that you've actually done that cash. Has to, there has to be something in writing. If a caretaker tells you I'll give you a receipt later, then say, well, I'll come back later then and give you the rent when you have the ability to give me a receipt. Um, another thing that happens quite often is that tenants believe that it, the tool to getting a repair done is holding back the rent. And we tell the tenants to keep themselves in good standing. Just pay your rent on time. Ensure that you do that because A, we can't assist you if you're uh, way behind in your rent. 
And secondly, it, as long as you're in good standing, then we can proceed with getting assistance to have you have the repair done. Um, sometimes tenants will move into properties where there's work needed and between the landlord and tenant, they'll have an agreement, for example, the landlord will say, I'll reduce your rent by $100 for the month of June and July, uh, as long as you paint uh, the living room and all the bedrooms. And so the tenant will go and pay the rent less $100, and then they'll receive a notice of termination for non-payment rent, or May. And so we encourage the tenants that if they make any type of work agreement deal like that, that they get something in writing from the landlord that says, this is the work that you're to do, this is how much I'm reducing your rent by, and it's for this specific month. This way there's no question. Um, also, not to change the locks on their doors or alter the rental unit without written permission. So the big encouragement here is things in writing. Um, verbal is okay, but you know there's nothing better than something written on a piece of paper. So this is what I like when I do speaking engagements with tenants. I always tell them, you know, the best thing to have is a, a rental file folder. Something that you have where every piece of paper that you've ever given to the landlord or received from the landlord is in. So the things that should be in there would be your condition report, either the one you've done with your landlord or your own, your tenancy agreement. There isn't always a tenancy agreement, but if there is one, make sure that you have that in there. A copy of the house rules, the notice to new tenant form, that's a rent regulation form that's required to be given to tenants on when they uh, move in, when they're signing the lease notices of increase in rent that they receive, all their rent receipts, their warning letters if they have, because um, it's not necessarily going to result in an eviction if they get a, a written warning, but it's always best to keep them. Uh, written agreements between the landlord and tenant for repair agreements, rent reduction agreements, work agreements, and then a logbook. And that logbook should have dates and times of any calls that you make to the landlord for repairs. And that I encourage because, um, for example, if the landlord's responsible to pay for water, you have a leaky toilet or a leaky tap, which may result in additional costs for the landlord. And you haven't had any success in having him fix it. You keep a log of the times that you've made the attempts to call so that if there is a point where the landlord uh, makes an attempt to file a claim against the tenant for the additional water they had to pay, that the tenant has a nice log of when they call the tenant or the landlord uh, on what days, what times, and then of course call the branch if they're not having success with something that may result in uh, additional costs to the landlord or themselves. Um, so evictions aren't just automatic, and so sometimes they require a warning. And so I've listed um, the reasons where a landlord would be required to give a tenant a warning letter before an actual eviction notice is issued. Um, not keeping the unit reasonably clean. And that doesn't mean that the tenant hasn't washed dishes for a couple days and laundry in the bedroom floor. That would be more uh, in a case of hoarding. Uh, they're required to give a written w warning letter that says that they're to clean the rental unit and give them a reasonable amount of time. So of course in a case of hoarding it wouldn't be one day. We would look at something reasonable maybe two to four weeks just depending on the severity. Damaging the unit, complex, or property. So again, if a tenant damages anything in their rental unit, the landlord has to list on the warning letter what's to be repaired and the time frame, and again, a reasonable amount of time. Uh, disturbing others in the building, the complex. So it's not three uh, for, for parties and stuff. Some tenants will think, well, I didn't get three warnings. It's not about three warnings. It's one, it could be as little as one warning. Uh, changing the locks without the landlord's permission, so the landlord would have to give the tenant a letter saying, change the lock back. If you don't change the lock back, then you're going to get a notice to move. Or provide them with a key. So sometimes it was, let's say for example, a not working lock. They didn't have any success in having that changed, so they changed it themselves, and as soon as the landlord discovered that it had been changed, as long as they provide a landlord the key, that should be sufficient and reasonable. Uh, threatening the safety of others in the building or complex should not be in there. So I apologize because that may not necessarily, that doesn't usually require a warning. So I apologize. I've actually reviewed that a couple times. That'll be on the next page. 
Anyway, breaking the terms of the tenancy agreement, so for example, a no pet rule. So if you have a pet and the landlord discovers a pet, it doesn't mean that they can evict you immediately. They can give you, or they have to give you a warning letter saying you're required to get rid of that pet within um, you know, a week or whatever the case may be. Then they'll come and do an inspection. If they discover that you haven't done that, then you will get a notice. Uh, breaking or uh, letting too many people live in the unit, so more that's on the lease or in violation of health department rules. So normally you should only be having who uh, was the applicant or whoever's listed on the tenancy agreement. And if the landlord tells you that you're allowed to have more stay with you, then you should get that in writing and put it in the rental file folder. That's important. Flip to the next one because that's it. Okay, so where no warning is required is for non-payment of rent. And the notice for that can be as little as the next day. Um, we don't often see that. Uh, landlords, you know, for the most part are giving, you know, anywhere from a week to sometimes a month, but there, there really is no minimum amount of time required for rent and no warning. Impairing the health or safety of others. Uh, and impairing the health or safety of others is removal of the smoke alarm. And so that's why I stress that. I know that that's a common thing and when tenants receive a five day notice for that, they're, very, they're quite shocked. And so that's one of the um, impairment uh, examples. Extreme nuisance and disturbance, so that would probably be a three day weekend party with you know, damages um, that are caused, etc. And we tell landlords that if they're going to uh, issue a notice of termination for that reason to ensure that they have sufficient enough evidence that it was extreme, that it wasn't just a one evening party, it was that it was, you know, a, a, they would have a good amount of evidence to show that it was extreme. Uh, for a payment of a security deposit or pet deposit that became NSF. So they can give a five day warning, a five day notice, eviction notice for that. If the tenant pays it though within the day, prior to the date of move out, then that notice will be void. And extreme damage to a unit. So when a landlord does issue a notice of termination for non-payment rent, it has to be in writing in an, uh, on an RTB form that is now uh, a new legislation and served in person to an adult or uh, an adult or the tenant at the rental unit. So they can't simply slip it under the door, stick it in the mailbox, tape it to the door. It has to be actually served to somebody in person. They can vary in length, so they can be immediate, which would be a rent example, to five months, depending on the vacancy rate. Uh, could be longer also, uh, depending on if they're school-aged children or if you have a lease. So if a tenant has noticed, or a client has received a notice of termination, what can they do? So that's where the panic sets in, and that's where we, uh, you know, we receive often phone calls, and I'm sure the clients come in. That's the stage of getting the notice. So of course they can choose to move out. Sometimes uh, that's the ideal thing for the tenant. Sometimes it's the inability to manage paying that specific amount of rent. And if their landlord terminates them, uh, for example, they'll only be responsible for rent up until the date they actually vacate. So they may just you know, decide, you know what, I am going to choose to move out. That's the best for me. They can dispute the notice and remain in the unit. So if they have received a notice for nuisance and disturbance have, after having received a warning, they may re think that the notice that they got was not reasonable, that they didn't cause an additional nuisance and disturbance and they're going to choose to dispute it. So they're going to remain in the unit and then they're going to proceed to a hearing at the branch. Or they may choose to proceed that way. They can also try to work out arrangements with the landlords themselves. Sometimes they'll just approach a landlord and say, listen, you know, I, I know you gave me a notice. Um, I'm going to pay the rent, here's the rent, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that the check hadn't cleared or whatever the case may be. Or of course they can contact the branch to get more information about the notice that they received or um, myself or someone else for mediation. So mediation is of course a way for people to settle disputes without, uh, at our branch without them going to a hearing. Uh, we offer landlords and tenants the choice of trying mediation before going to a hearing or as a way to settle a dispute before it gets to that stage. 
Mediation is voluntary, of course, so both the landlord and tenant have to agree to mediate. And also it's informal, but if an agreement's reached, it's binding, final, and enforceable. So in mediation, a neutral person such as myself, called a mediator, sits down with landlords and tenants and tries to help them reach an agreement on a claim or an application for an order of possession. Application for an order of possession is trying to get possession back of your rental unit. So when we do the mediated agreements, they're binding. So that means that as soon as the tenant and landlord have reached an agreement, that's it. Not, no changes can be made unless there's been a, a typing error or whatever the case may be. So myself as a mediation officer, I'll always do the handwritten notes, type the agreement, send it out in the mail. They're given time to respond if there is any type of typing error. I'll refer back to my handwritten notes and sometimes, I mean, we were all human, we make mistakes. But if it's to change a term or something to that effect, we can't do that. The agreement is final. It's enforceable if somebody doesn't adhere to it. So for an example, if a tenant says that they're going to pay rent on the 15th of October and the 1st of November and they don't, then the landlord can get an automatic order for them to move. Um, I myself um, try and put myself in the place of the tenants and say, you know what, this is an opportunity for you to continue living in your rental unit Make sure that you give me payments that you're going to be able to attain because it's, this isn't for you to fail, this is for you to succeed. You've been given a, a, you know, basically a gift to, to continue living your unit. Let's try and make this work. And so you know, because an order can be issued, we try that that's not going to be the end result. The end result is that they're going to be able to stay in their unit. Uh, so what are the benefits of mediation? So usually the best solution to a problem is where the people involved have come up with a solution themselves. So these agreements are often more realistic and have the benefit of being manageable. So they can set up dates and times for repayment options or for completing repairs that are possible for them to follow through on. So if somebody did get a warning letter, for example, for doing a repair, they won't have the ability to complete their repair by the date that the landlord has set out on the warning letter we can do some type of agreement that says a tenant agrees to repair the broken window by such and such a date or to pay the landlord to repair the window that they cause damage to in $20 payments per month for the next six months because they may not have uh, you know, the 100 or $200 to pay that immediately. They're faster than going to a hearing, so they come up to the solu with a solution at the mediation meeting. And of course, the hugest part is the fact that they're confidential. Um, confidentiality is a big thing because if it goes to a hearing, there's an order issued and that makes it difficult because then that creates a public record. And so it's encouraged uh, to, to do mediation because as long as they keep up with their end of the bargain as far as the mediation goes, it's a private agreement. No one ever has to know about it unless it's breached. So that's one of the hugest factors that uh, we encourage is the privacy part of it is the key. We also have uh, an independent advisor office in our branch where they assist uh, with tenants filling out forms, uh, with filing claims with the branch, uh, to file appeals with the Residential Tenancies Commission, and prepare for hearings that we hold at the branch or at the commission. Um, the independent advisors may represent tenants in RTB or RTC hearings in certain circumta circumstance, sorry, if they have difficulty speaking or understanding English, if they have physical or cognitive, mental or emotional problems, and they're on a limited or low income. So if you feel that your client may qualify for assistance from the independent advisor office, they can contact the independent advisor office at that number. I have um, placed, uh, there were some takeaway packages that, uh, when you came in that were available to you. Inside that takeaway package, I've stapled um, my card along with the client services unit card. So we'll have that phone number if you, know, if you give us a call. In those takeaway packages, I've put a fact sheet, uh, which is a compilation of a lot of what I spoke about today and more. I've also put examples of the forms, and when I said that the forms have to be issued in person, they should be in the, say exactly what our forms say. They can drop, the landlords can drop their own forms, but they have to be in this exact fashion with the exact wording. I've put uh, examples of the notice to new tenant forms, the notice of increase in rent forms, 
I've seen notices of increase in red forms issued on pieces of cardboard. They should be on the proper forms. Um, and that's me. Prior to my hairdo last night, I did have dark hair yesterday. Now it's light today. So we do have time for questions because I kind of rushed through that presentation, I know, but I wanted to make sure that uh, we were able to keep back on fashion. I don't have the little socks on though. <laughs> So if you have any questions today, I'm, I'm going to be here now and then I'll also be around for the rest of the day so you can certainly approach me as well as my card here. So if you don't have an opportunity to talk to me today, you can certainly give me a call at any time if you ever have any questions or need help. Thank you. I just have a question about the mediated agreement. Um, in my profession, I've come across a situation where the clients were kind of bullied into a mediated agreement. I got involved after the fact. Uh, landlords supplied false information to you guys, and eventually we got it worked out by the clients just eventually moving out. But um, if a mediated agreement is binding and there's no changes, there has to be some kind of way to address that because if somebody falsifies information to you guys and you guys act in that and immediate agreements reached, then how is that right? And this this happened within the last year I guess. Okay. Well I can't I can just comment about what I know our approach is with respect to mediation. A lot of it comes from intuition. I'll often maybe sense sometimes that a tenant is not comfortable with what they're calling in with. And so I'll ask obviously I'll ask a bunch of questions. Um, I'm, I myself especially uh, tell the tenants, you're probably going to be upset with me, but I'm probably going to tell you this enough that you're going to be sick of hearing it, but I want to make sure that what you're agreeing to today, you understand what the end result is. And so that's important because it can result in, in eviction, and the fact that it's not appealable is important, right? And I understand where you're coming from. And so if I know that we make all attempts to ensure that the tenants are clear. Um, I, you know, the, it's not going to be where, you know, out of 300 mediations and there might be not three cases where something was misunderstood. Um, if I feel like there's either um, a language barrier or a, an issue where the tenant isn't completely understanding, I encourage them to come into branch because most mediations that I'll do are over the phone um, or pre-hearing. So. I can't really comment like that may happen here and there, but if we feel or sense that someone's being bullied into it, we won't mediate. That's, that's not the goal. The issue was is that the landlord falsified information stating that payments for rent were not received. They were being paid by social assistance. We verified that all the rent had been paid, but because it was a mediated agreement, there was no recourse. The landlord falsified the information. Okay, so when we receive, uh, just so you know, if, if we do get information from a landlord that a mediated agreement has been breached, we, do, we don't just simply issue an order. We contact the tenants, and if the tenants tell us that the rent's been paid, like we send a letter that says the landlord has indicated that your rent's not been paid on this date or in this amount or whatever the case may be, if, if you have other information or if you have evidence that it has been paid, then contact us. Well, that was done. Well, okay. I, 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 can, I, you I know, your, you your case this. may be specific, and so we may have to talk on the outside of this process, but that, that just, just so you realize that rarely happens. That, that doesn't happen very often. Okay, so we'll talk further. <laughs> I've run into uh, situations in the past few years where clients have been refused housing because landlords have given them, and I, I guess there's a list somewhere where people who have been evicted, so they're kind of like... Sorry, I missed that. Pe people have been in orders of, of okay. possession and eviction um, for no real reason other than probably just not getting along or something to that effect, and I've seen it where it was issued and now they have a history, yeah. and it's false. So how does one go about um, bringing up the history 
that is false and preventing these people from acquiring housing and correcting it because somebody decided to put on record at RTB that well, these people are, have been evicted. Okay, so Falsely. The, the public record is issued by orders, orders that are from hearings that were held either by the branch or by the Residential Tenants Feeds Commission. So they may be classified as false by the person who was involved and they don't agree with the outcome of the hearing, but the order was issued at the branch and at the, at the commission level and the decision is the decision. And so if the tenants don't agree with you know, the results of the hearing, you know, there's nothing that we can do to change the public record. The only thing that the tenant can do is explain to the next landlord what that situation was. What, what was, you know, what, why did they end up going to the hearing? Why they believe they weren't, like why that order was wrong. But other than that, I mean, there isn't much that, that public record exists uh, based on hearings that are held. That's the only thing that I can say. And if a person believes it's false, it's based on one or two hearings and the results of those hearings. You mean get rid of that, the, the public record? No, no. That's why we encourage mediation and trying to work something out outside of that hearing process. That's, that's too bad and that's why we're trying to bring awareness, right, of the branch's existence and about mediation and about having those tools to ensure that it's not that they're coming to you after the fact that they came to you before. So let's hope that in the end that that's more what comes to you as an advance rather than, than after. Um, I was just curious to know that um, are all landlords like required to be a part of the residential tenancy branch? Or if just because you just because you rent property out, like um, I had I once had an incident where I had to call residential tenancies just about um, whether or not a landlord was allowed to enter my suite without written notice. And uh, one of the questions they asked me was whether or not my lease agreement was a part of residential tenancies. So is it possible for landlords to be renting out property without being a part of? The residential tenancies branch? Yeah, there's no requirement for the landlords to even have ever contacted our office and some don't unfortunately even know of our existence. And that's all about our goal for educating. And sometimes unfortunately tenants don't know of our existence either. And so no, they're not required to, but we certainly hope that they have educated themselves enough to know what they're required to do and what their obligations are. Um, I'll often have a situation, this is just an example, I'll often have a situation where a landlord has come in and attempted to, to terminate a tenant or gone through a hearing process or a mediation process. And once we're done with the mediation or through the mediation, I've really come to realize that these landlords are not educated. And I'll kind of joke with them and say, okay, after we've done this process, now I want you to sit with me. We're having landlord school for a little while. And that's what I do. I sit down and make sure that they're aware of what their obligations are, what the tenants' rights are, so that they leave there at least feeling a little more uh, knowledgeable what they're required to do. So yeah, sometimes we don't see a landlord for, for 20 years and that's because they do know their stuff and they, you know what I mean, or otherwise we'll see them a lot because they haven't educated themselves enough and that's what we're there for, we're there to educate and, as well. And uh, another question I have is um, with like regards to prevention like homelessness and stuff, um, especially with difficult to house tenants. Um, uh, have you ever considered uh, finding someone who would be able to lead uh, like a tenant to tenant with the landlord present kind of mediation? So, so that if there is an unruly tenant living in the same building, then maybe the person that's having an issue with them being disturbing, then maybe they could come and have a common ground with the landlord to discuss how they're going to resolve their issues and still maintain their housing. But it doesn't happen commonly, but we have in the past had that situation because that is a difficult situation to, to fix, right? Two tenants that don't get along and so one's accusing one of disturbing, the other one's accusing the others of disturbing. So we've had those situations. 
Um, normally, we will make recommendations to the landlord to try and fix those things. But I know, you know, through my nine years there, we have had a couple times where the, everybody's come in and we've tried to resolve the issues. Yeah, so that's not outside of what we can give a, sh a try to anyway. I was just wondering, usually to generate a complaint, there's a $25 fee that has to be paid by the tenant, correct? Sorry. In, if, if somebody wants to, like if a tenant wants to file a complaint against a landlord uh, for repairs and that kind of thing, usually they have to fill out some forms and there's a $25 fee? No, there's no fee for request to have repairs. The only time tenant has to pay a fee for or what you, what you may be referring to is a, a claim. Yeah. So it's like a small claim, but held at the branch based on um, maybe damages done to their property or additional money that they had to pay for hydro because they had windows that uh, didn't close properly in the winter, those types of things. There is a $20 filing fee required. There isn't a fee required if they don't get their security deposit back unless it, it surpasses two years. So within two years, you have to ask the branch to make a decision on why you didn't get your security deposit back. People don't usually wait that long anyway, but yep. yeah, the only fee that, that you may be referring to is $20 so for the filing a claim. What happens if the tenant can't afford to pay that $20? Uh, if the tenant can't afford to pay that $20, uh, we ask them to perhaps ask family, friends, other resources, but we, as, as a rule, not to my knowledge, uh, have the ability to waive that fee. Someone's indicating that EIA will pay that filing fee for a claim. It's a brand new directive someone's saying in the audience, just so everybody can hear. Okay, I think I might just take one more question. I'm just wondering if since you started, uh, or since the Independent Advisor Office, uh, I, I understand that's a relatively new thing. Yeah. Have you noticed any increase in like marginalized people coming to the branch or like inner city people who might otherwise not have come or people who are... You know, you know yeah. I myself won't be and I'm not at the front line so it's difficult for me to answer. Um, I'm sort of behind the scenes doing, but uh, I don't know. I, ca I can't answer that question, sorry. Well, that information's on our on our pamphlet right now. If we can circulate that pamphlet really widely, then yeah. And again, I encourage you if you ever have any questions or concerns of your clients, um, if you uh, want, you can certainly give me a call. Sometimes I am hard to reach because I am mediating, but uh, you leave me a message and I'll get back to you. Or if it's something urgent and you can't reach me, the client services unit number is also stapled to the inside of the uh, takeaway package. Thanks again.